He says to them, Ya sahibayi sijni, O my companions of prison, sahibayi, dual of sahib. Who is sahib? Friend. A companion. He says, O oh, my two companions of prison. Now there are different reasons because of which we know people and because of which people become our friends. Like for example, school or work or class. What is it that's common over here between Yusuf and these two men? What is it? Prison. And that's something that you don't really want to talk about because it's something that's not very positive. But these words, what do they show you? How Yusuf embraced his situation that we are in prison, we better accept it. We don't accept it if we continue to deny it. What good is it going to bring to us? And look at how he calls them his friends, his companions. Oh my companions of prison. They called him a muhsin, right? He was a muhsin, wasn't he? Look at the way he's talking to them. He calls them my friends. And this teaches another important thing. Always make yourself relatable. When people are asking you, when people are asking you for advice, for an answer, whether it's children or other adults, whoever it may be, if they're asking you something, always make yourself approachable, relatable to the one who's asking you. Don't portray yourself as someone who's very big and big shot and don't act like a diva. Okay? Act like a normal person. So that people can talk to you. People can relate with you. Let people feel comfortable with you. So Yusuf a.s. said, Ya sahiba yisijini, O my companions of prison, a'arbabun, are multiple gods, arbab, plural of rab, and who is rab? Master, God, over here gives meaning of God, are multiple gods, mutafarriquna, ones that are different. Separate. Mutafarriqun from Farah. Qaf. Tafarruq. To be separate. So, different, different gods. Are they better? Amillahu or Allah. Al-Wahid. The one. Al-Qahar. The prevailing. Al-Qahar from Qahar. To be dominant. To have complete control. So, Al-Qahar. The one before whom everything is submissive. He asks them a simple, logical question. And he leaves them to think about it so they can use their mind. And what's the question that he asks them? Think about it yourself. What's better? Having multiple gods or one god? Having multiple gods have divided powers or one god who has all the power with him? What's better? What's better? And this is a very important darwa point. Anyone to whom you want to prove tawheed to, this is a very simple logic that you can give them. A question. Very simple. Now think about it. If there is food that is being prepared by five people, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It's going to be ruined. Which is why, if the food that has to be prepared is of large quantity, then there is always one head chef. Right? One head chef, not five head chefs. Why? Because one should have the final say. Right? Have you ever worked on a project in which you had to ask multiple people for their feedback? Any project? Like, for example, you are rearranging the furniture in your room, and you have to take permission from your mom and from your dad and your sibling and your cousin and your auntie and everybody in the world. So then what happens? Can you get your work done? No. Graphic designers know this really well. Because they're designing something and they have to send in what they've designed for approval. One person says, I don't like this. And the other person says, no, I actually do like this. Keep it. Delete everything else, but keep this. One person says, yes, it's ready for print. And another says, no, 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 no. Nowhere near printing. What does a graphic designer do ultimately? Do this yourself. Thank you very much not working for you anymore. I'll go find some other project. Because when you are being governed by multiple people, then, of course, all those people are going to think differently. They have different tastes. They have different way of thinking. They're going to give different feedback. Who are you supposed to please? A or B or C or D? Who are you meant to please? 
And your life is going to become a mess also. If you are being taken care of by multiple people, even that is going to ruin you. It's like, you know, if a child was just fed by the mother breakfast, and the child goes to the grandmother, and the grandmother says, Oh, my dear grandchild came hungry. You look so tired. Come, let me feed you some breakfast. And she gives him egg, and, and the poor child doesn't want to eat. He's being force-fed. Or he's being, you know, encouraged to eat so that he can win something. What is a child supposed to do? When you've got too many people looking after you, taking care of you, telling you what to do, what happens? Your life becomes a mess. So Yusuf salam asks them a logical, simple question. What's better? Multiple gods? Multiple beings managing your life? Or one being, Al-Wahid, Al-Qahar, the prevailing. You know why people have difficulty believing in God even? Like, you know how there are so many people who don't believe in God? Why? What's the reason? Because generally the image that people have, the understanding that people have of God is imperfect. It is not correct. They think that God only creates you and then leaves you. Or God only legislates, meaning He gives you commands. He tells you what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. But in Islam, in our religion, when we believe in Tawheed, it's a very complete understanding of God. His oneness. His perfection in every way. Perfection in every way. That He is free from and He's above any kind of deficiency. You have 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know like how Christians, majority of them, their faith is that God is all about love. Right? But in Islam, what do we learn? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's al-wadud, He's al-rahman, He's al-rahim, but at the same time, He's also shadid al-iqab. Shadid al-iqab. So it's a very complete understanding. And this is very logical. Very logical. And this is the reason why many people, when they come across atheists, they actually first congratulate them. Like Dr. Zakir and I, he says that when I meet an atheist, I say to them, congratulations, because you said the first part of the kalima, la ilaha, there is no God. Now I have to convince you, inshallah, illallah, but Allah. And that you can do when you understand who God is. And who is God? Al-Wahid, al qaha The one who controls the sunset and the one who controls my life one who controls my body and my food, everything. I was just thinking, he said a very, very small sentence, but he made it so effective because he started, started off with, Ya Sahib Asij. He connected to them. And then he said that he told them who Allah is. He provoked their thinking. So he questioned them and he provoked their thinking. And then he ended with two specific names of Allah, which would totally define him. And it was such a small sentence, but it's so... Such a small but comprehensive and complete message. All right? So then what happened? Yusuf a.s. he continued. He said, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ You do not worship. مِن دُونِهِ Besides him, meaning besides Allah, إِلَّا except asma'an Names. سَمَّيْتُمُوهَا That you have named. Meaning, the gods that you worship, what's their reality? They have no reality to them. They're just abstract ideas and thoughts that you have named. Other than that, there is no reality. This is just like, there are so many fictional characters out there. Are they real? Are they real? No, they're purely fictional. And if you start believing that they're real, it can cause a lot of damage to you. It can really affect you. Like recently, you may have heard about those 12-year-old girls who strongly believed in this fictional character, Slender Man. Hmm? That you have to murder someone in order to know him or God knows what. So they actually planned for several months to kill one of their friends. These are 12 year old girls. They stabbed their friends so over a dozen times, so many times, and they could not kill her. And eventually they just left her and a biker, you know, saw that girl and she was saved then. And these girls are actually being prosecuted as adults. 12-year-old girls, they believe so firmly in a fictional character. What happens is when we surround ourselves with lies and we think about them, we talk about them, we see them, 
then we start believing in them. And we start living in that kind of world. This is how shirk began also. This is how shirk begins in the lives of people also. Just a thought, just an idea, talk about it, make up a story, tell others about it, write it down, make a picture, now give some detail, now add some drama, and then people believe in it. If you go deeper into it, what's the reality? There's no reality. Who told you there's a God that is like an elephant or, or that a cow is a God? Who told you? What's the evidence? What's the evidence? What proof do you have that God has a son? And if he really has a son, why did he stop at one? Why not more children? Why not? Does it make sense? Go deeper into the issue and you will realize that shirk is always falsehood. It's based on falsehood. There is no reality to it. So Yusuf a.s. says, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِهِ إِلَّا أَسْمَاءً سَمَّيْتُمُوهَا أَنْتُمْ You have invented them وَآبَاؤُكُمْ And your forefathers. مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِن سُلْطَان Allah has not revealed any authority for this. There is no proof for shirk. In الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ الْحُكْمُ In not الْحُكْمُ The judgment إِلَّا except لِلَّهِ for Allah. Meaning all judgment, legislation, it is whose right? Allah's right exclusively. He alone has the power to legislate. All governance is with Him. He decides all the matters of this universe. All the matters of this universe, He is the one who decides them. Whether it's about someone's life, someone's death, someone's provision, someone's sickness, someone's health, or what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do, all this legislation belongs to who? The Creator. And because all judgment is with Him, think about what He has commanded. What has He commanded? Amara, He has ordered, Allah ta'budu illa iya, that you do not worship anyone but Him. ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ القيم. That is the right religion. Al-Qayyim. Qaf wa meem. Qayyim. That which is straight, correct, proper. That is the authentic religion, the correct religion, because it has logical proofs, and it's also got textual evidence. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But most of the people, they do not know. They do not have this knowledge. What knowledge? Of Tawheed. Of the fact that only Allah deserves worship. And that Allah has ordered us that we worship Him alone. Because in order to believe in Tawheed, in order to worship Allah, what is necessary first and foremost? Knowledge. فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا Right? Know that there is no God worthy of worship but Him. Think about it. If you want to pray, can you pray without learning how to pray? Salah. What is the first step? What is the first step? Knowledge. But most of the people, they do not know. So we see that Yusuf a.s. when he's doing da'wah to them, finally at the end, then he criticizes shirk. At first, he told them about himself, then he explained to them what tawheed was, and then finally he criticized shirk. What do we do? Hmm? If we want to do da'wah to anybody, if someone seems interested in Islam, then we believe that the first thing we have to prove to them is that Bible is not right. Hmm? Or that these false gods whom you worship, they're not right. What's the correct way? What was the way of the prophets? What was the way of the prophets? Tell people about Tawheed. If you teach them about Allah, you know like when someone falls in love, then what happens? They forget about everything else. Right? And who do they remember? Their beloved. So likewise, if you show to someone the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they begin to believe in Him, if they begin to love Him, then everything will fall in place. We come across people who, you know, eat haram, who are not praying salah. What's the root cause? What's the root cause? It's the weakness of faith. It's that distance from their Lord. So what is your responsibility? Convince them about the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amaze them. So that they will want to believe in Allah. And when they will want to believe in Allah, they will willingly give up what they're holding on to, what they're clinging to. You know, my daughter, two and a half years old, if she's got something and you want to take it from her, you're never going to win. But 
As soon as she sees something that she wants, literally whatever is in her hands, she will drop it. She will drop it. And she will come running without you even calling her. And this is human nature, that when you see something more beautiful, more attractive, something that you want, then whatever is with you, you can leave it easily. You can forget about it easily. But you've got to love. You've got to love what you're heading towards. If you don't love it, if you don't seek it, you don't want it, then you're not going to give up what you have. So what happened then? Yusuf a.s. he told him the interpretation. Very briefly, he did da'wah, and then he told him the interpretation of their dreams. He said, Ya sahiba yasijni, O my companions, my two companions of the prison, Amma ahadukuma, as for one of you two, فَيَسْقِي رَبَّهُ khamra. So he will give to drink khamr, Wine to who? To Rabbahu, to his Rabb. What does that mean? Remember that Rabb also means master, a Sayyid. Master, owner. From the same root is Rabbatul Bayt. Rabbatul Bayt is who? The woman of the house who's supposed to be looking after the house. So for example, your mom, she does the groceries. And also quite possible that she manages the bills also. It's also possible that she looks after the main things around the house, the children, everything. So, Rabbatul Bayt. That doesn't mean that the husband doesn't have any authority. He also has authority because he's the Qawwam. Okay? So, Rabb over here means master. Yusuf a.s. said that one of you, what your dream means is that you will give wine to your master. Who is this person? The first guy. What was his dream? That I saw myself pressing wine. I saw myself pressing fruits in order to extract wine from them. Alright? So, Yusuf a.s. told him the interpretation that you will give wine to your master. وَأَمَّا الْآخَرْ And as for the other, فَيُصْلَبُ He will be crucified. فَتَأْكُلُ الطَّيْرُ مِنْ رَأْسِهِ And birds will eat from his head. He will be assassinated, he will be crucified, and left hanging to the point that birds will come and eat his head, eat his dead body. قضي الأمر The matter has been decreed. الذي فيه تستفتيان That which you both were inquiring about. تستفتيان is from fatwa. What is fatwa? Who doesn't know what fatwa is? Everybody knows what fatwa is? Okay, a legal verdict, right? So, Tastaftiyan, you were inquiring about this matter, and now this matter has been decreed. Meaning, you asked for the interpretation of the dream, now the dream has been interpreted, so now this will happen. One of you will be set free, and the other is going to be assassinated. He is going to be killed. What do we see here? Two things I want you to notice. First of all, Yusuf a.s. doesn't say, the interpretation of your dream is this. And you, you're going to die. You're going to live and you're going to die. He doesn't give the interpretation like that. He mentions it in a way that is not hurtful, that is not scary. And at the same time, the message is clear. Each of them understood what his dream meant. And this is the way of giving bad news. Because sometimes when we have to give bad news, it's very difficult for us. And we say, you know what, forget about it. They're going to cry, they're going to scream, they're going to be upset. What do I care? I'm used to this by now. No. Be sensitive to the feelings of other people. There's this comedian and his really famous line um, that he tells like his audience about his father is that somebody's going to get hurt real bad. And basically his father uses that to tell him that like you've done something wrong and like you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. So somebody's going to get hurt really bad. So what that means is you've done something wrong and you're going to get in trouble. He's not saying you. He's saying somebody. It's not harsh. It's not hurtful. But at the same time the message is clear. So Yusuf a.s. did it the same way and we should also use the same way. Also one more thing we see that Yusuf a.s. gave them the interpretation and he said, قُضِيَ amr The matter has been decreed. What does this mean? This means that when a dream is interpreted, 
then then what will happen the exact same thing will happen meaning that interpretation will actually take place then because in a hadith we learn the prophet sallallahu alaihi said that the dream is tied to a bird's leg it's an example that a bird is flying right it's up in the air but as long as it's not interpreted if it is interpreted then it becomes a reality because once the bird will come and sit then it's sitting then it will happen so be very careful about interpreting dreams whether it's your own dreams or other people's dreams if somebody tells you about their dream don't say i think you're going to die i think something terrible is going to happen no no always always comfort the other person ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for khair seek allah's protection from evil and don't be hasty in talking don't be hasty in giving your opinion qudi al amru alladhi fihi tastaftiyan wa qala an yusuf alayhi salam said lil ladhi to the one who wanna he thought annahu that indeed he najin would go free min huma from them to najin from the root letters noon jim wow najat what does that mean in ja to be saved so yusuf alayhi salam He said to the person whom he thought was going to be saved, he was going to leave the prison. And who is this person? The first one, whose dream was that he was pressing wine, and the interpretation of that was that he was going to serve his master. Yusuf alayhi salam said to him, "Udkurni, mention me in the Rabbik before your master." Meaning, when you are set free and you go back to your role, you go back to serving your master. then do mention me to your master and tell him that i have been put here unjustly udkurni inda rabbik would you do that if you were in yusuf alayhi salam's position would you do that that if you were suffering and you find out that someone through them you could get help would you approach them for help would you at least make a hint of it yeah Like for example, if your head is hurting and you really want somebody to massage your head, you might say, oh, "My head's hurting so bad. It's just never the same if you press your own head." You know, you would at least hint it to the other person. Uh, you know, please massage my head. Right? We do that all the time. Yusuf alayhi salam also did that. He said, "Udkurni in the Rabbik." But what happened? For ansa hu shaytan wa dikra Rabbi. But Shaytan made him forget to mention to his master. Shaytan made this man forget to mention Yusuf alayhi salam to his master. So as a result, فَلَبِثَ فِي السِّجْنِ So he remained in the prison بِضْعَ سِنِينَ For a few years. بِضْر بِضْر is used for a number between 3 and 9 and according to others 5 and 9. So a minimum of 3 years, maximum of 9. Or... minimum of 5 maximum of 9 so yusuf alayhi salam stayed in the prison for up to 9 years can you imagine being stuck somewhere and not knowing what's going to happen in the future when relief is going to come so difficult he stayed in the prison for this long now what does this show to us that sometimes you're in a problem in some distress and something happens and because of that you feel okay it's all going to be over now it's all going to be over now but then what happens what happens it's not over the trial is prolonged it is prolonged like for example the person is drowning in the water he's swimming 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 striving to stay afloat and then what happens he finds a piece of wood or something and then he clings on to it and then after some time that breaks And then what happens he's swimming 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 trying to stay afloat he reaches the shore as soon as he gets there he misses it reaches a boat as soon as he gets there he misses it he loses that opportunity so should we despair at that time give up whatever it's not happening no remember in surah hud what did we learn that there are some people who give up hope very quickly they become yaus they despair of allah's mercy they despair of relief from allah and there are others who stay hopeful so stay hopeful be hopeful another meaning of this ayah is that fa ansa hu shaytan shaytan made him forget who's the him over here 
Yusuf a.s. Shaytan made Yusuf a.s. forget dhikra rabbih to remember his Lord and depend only on him and expect only from him. So, as a consequence of this, he remained in the prison for a couple years. That instead of asking Allah alone and depending on him exclusively, Yusuf a.s. thought that perhaps this man, his master, perhaps through that way I will get relief. He thought relief could come by way of this opportunity, by way of this means. Now you might wonder that what's wrong with that? It's perfectly normal that if you're in some distress and there is someone who comes before you and you think that they can help you, what's the harm in asking them? There's no harm in asking them. But remember that hasanatul abrah, sayyiatul muqarrabin. The good deeds of righteous are like the sins of those who are even closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For an average person, doing something like this is completely acceptable. But for a prophet of Allah, seeking help from another person, it doesn't befit the prophet of Allah. The prophet of Allah should rely only on who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the higher you are, the more is expected of you. The more is expected of you. And this teaches us a general lesson also, that it does not befit a person who has been given a virtue above others that he does what average people do. Like for example, if you are able in your body, your hands are perfectly fine, does it befit you that you sit in front of the television for like five hours on a movie marathon? Does it befit you? While your mother with her severe backache and her headache and then her old feet, she's standing in the kitchen and working away. Does it befit you to sit there like an average person? When you have that strength, that ability, it doesn't befit you. So likewise, a prophet of Allah, because he receives revelation from Allah, he has a great responsibility upon his head, it does not befit him to seek help from others. What befits him? That he relies only and solely upon who? Upon who? His Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this was not the end. The test was prolonged. A simple thing was made difficult. However, remember that after the difficulty, relief is nearby. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He helps His servants. Even though apparently it doesn't seem like it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always working in favor of the believer. Because nothing that happens to a believer can be bad. Yusuf salam ended up in prison, stayed there for so long, but from here, success came. How? وقال الملك, and the king said, إِنِّي أَرَى Indeed I saw, meaning in my dream, سبع بقرات, seven cows, that were simanin, that were fat, obese. Siman is a plural of samin. Samin, with a seen, not tha. Okay? Sa, samin, samina, that means precious. Valuable, and that's the name. Right? With a scene, Samina, what would that mean? What would that mean? So please, if you know somebody by the name of Samina, call them Samina, not Samina. Okay? And if your name is Samina, don't call yourself Samina. Okay? Call yourself Samina. Because, uh, be careful about what you call yourself. And what other people call you. So the king, now he has a dream. Out of all people who has a dream, the king. And this dream is really bothering him because he sees in his dream seven big, obese, fat cows that ya'kuluhunna, it eats them up. Who eats these seven cows up? Sab'un, seven others, meaning seven other cows that are ijafun. Ijaf is the plural of arjaf. Arjaf, slim, slender, I mean, a very weak animal whose bones are even showing. There's no fat at all. Why? Because not enough food. Alright? So, he sees in his dream that seven thin cows are eating up seven fat cows. If you saw that in a dream, would that scare you? What's going on? Cows eating cows? And seven? And seven really chunky ones and seven really thin ones? What's going on here? And he saw in his dream was سَبْعَ سُمْبُلَاتٍ and seven spikes. 
Sumbulat, plural of sumbulah. We read this earlier also in Surah Al-Baqarah. What is sumbulah? Ear of grain. Like for example, corn. Okay, that's what? Ear of corn because you have one thing on which you have many, 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 many kernels. Alright? Likewise, wheat, for instance, there is one stem, alright, and on top of it there is a cluster. So that one stem with a cluster on top, what is it called? Sumbula. So this man, this king, he says he saw in his dream seven sumbula, seven spikes that were khudrin, that were green. Wa ukhar and others, meaning seven others that were yabisat, that were dry. Yabisat is a plural of yabisa from yabasin, yabs to be dry. So he saw seven fresh green spikes of grain and seven others that were dry. He said, Ya ayyuhal mala, O my chiefs, O my courtiers, aftuni fi ru'yaya, tell me about my ru'ya, about my dream, in kuntum li ru'ya ta'burun, if you interpret the dreams. Meaning I've had this dream, it's really bothering me, tell me what it means. If you had a dream like that, would you be concerned? Would you be concerned? So he's saying that this dream has got to have some kind of meaning. What is the meaning of this dream? All oh, my people tell me. He's asking his mala, his courtiers. What does this show? That even a non-Muslim can have a true dream. Because this king was not a Muslim. Even a non-Muslim can have a true dream. Which tells us that just because a person has true dreams doesn't mean they're very good and very righteous. And they're forgiven by Allah. And they will definitely go to Jannah. True dreams are not the basis of success. Okay? So what happened? Qalu, they said, his people said, Adghasu ahlam. It's just a mixture of false dreams. Don't pay attention. Adghas is the plural of dhigs. Dhad, ghain, sa. And dhigs is a bunch of twigs or dry grass that fit in your fist. So think about it. Dry twigs, dry grass that you just take a handful of, they can fit in your hand, in your fist. Now, they're all mixed up, right? Mixed up. So from this, a blaz is used for a dream that is a mixture of random thoughts. So basically, a meaningless dream. Because that is what meaningless dreams are about. A mixture of random thoughts. That you were flying, and then you were swimming, and then you were eating something, and then somebody just disappeared, and then... Something was black and it turned into white. It's just random thoughts. Right? You were working on a computer and then you ate that computer and then God knows what happened. Just random thoughts. Crazy things that you see in your dream. This is abra, A mixture of thoughts. Ahlam, plural of hulm. And hulm is a false dream. A dream that is false, that is scary, that is obscene in its nature. So they said it's just false dreams. Don't pay attention to it. Don't bother about it. Don't worry about it. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِتَأْوِيلِ الْأَحْلَامِ بِعَالِمِينَ And we don't know about the interpretation of dreams. Meaning we are not of people who interpret dreams. We don't have this kind of knowledge. We don't have this kind of information. We don't have this kind of skill. Now, what happened? وَقَالَ And he said, who? الَّذِي نَجَا مِنْهُمَا The one who was saved from them too. From who too? The two people? who met Yusuf a.s. in the prison. The guy who was saved, who went back to his role of serving his master wine, this man, he spoke up and وَدَّكَرَ and he remembered from ذَال كَافْرَ إِدَّكَرَ is from dhikr. Alright? What does dhikr mean? To remember. But إِدَّكَرَ is to remember something that was forgotten. To remember something that was forgotten. So this man, now he remembered بَعْدَ أُمَّةٍ After a long period of time. The word ummah, if you remember, I told you once that it has four meanings. It means nation, and it also means a time period. So he remembered after a long period of time, I mean, it was a couple of years, he said, أَنَا أُنَبِّيُكُمْ He said, I will tell you بِتَأْوِيلِي with its interpretation. فَأَرْسِلُونَ to just send me. Send me, let me go. Let me go to the prison and I will get you the interpretation of this dream. So they sent him to the prison to get Yusuf a.s. Now, what do we see here? That there are 
at times things going on in your life that you want to get resolved immediately. Does it happen? Or if not immediately, you want them to get resolved already because it's been so long. Like for example, somebody might have, you know, started their university and then what happened a year later they got married and then a year later they had a baby and it's been like six years or something and they still don't have their degree. They're like, I just want to get over it already. I just want to move on. I want this to end. But it doesn't happen. As soon as you think you're this close, you make a whole plan. This year I'm going to take these many courses and this semester and these many courses and that semester. So and so is going to babysit my children and I will just get it over with. But what happens? Let's say you got pregnant again. You're like, I want to finish this already, but I can't get over it. There's obstacles coming in your way again and again. You want to get out of the house to go get groceries. Somebody calls you. And then as soon as you have the kids ready, somebody calls you again. I'm coming in five minutes. Are you home? I really, really need to talk to you about something important. You're like, okay, but I'm only available for 10 minutes because I have to run. They're like, okay, they come, they stay for half an hour. And then what happens? You see that it's time for dinner. You can't go. You've missed your grocery trip. You didn't get to go. Then you want to go the next day. Again, you cannot go. Is this real stuff or am I talking about just a few people who face these problems in life? Does it happen with you? You make a plan and you think it's just perfect and you think it's going to happen, but it just doesn't happen. You want to get over it already. But remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the planner of all things. And for everything, there is a fixed time. For everything, there is a fixed time. Yusuf salam went to prison. And everyone who goes to prison eventually comes out. Either, you know, free, alive, or dead, whatever. You're not staying in there forever. Because even when a person dies, and there is the hereafter. Right? Which is for eternity. So anything that happens, it doesn't happen forever. Eventually it's going to end. Eventually it will. But there was supposed to be the right time when Yusuf salam would come out of prison. If he had come out of the prison earlier, it wouldn't have been suitable for his success. He had to come out now. And this is the reason this man, he remembered Yusuf salam after so many years now. Typically, do people forget their dreams? Meaningful dreams? No. And if somebody told you the interpretation, would you forget that? And especially if it happens exactly as I told you, what's the chance that you would forget it? You wouldn't. You would remember it for life. People talk about dreams that they had 50 years ago, 15 years ago, 5 years ago. Right? But this man forgot about this dream completely. He forgot about Yusuf a.s. completely. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to happen. Because Yusuf a.s. was supposed to come out of prison at a specific time, at a certain time. So always remember, you want to get things done, they're not getting done, look at yourself first, check yourself, are you falling short in something? Do istighfar, seek Allah's help, but don't give up. It's just a test. The other day I was listening to a lecture by Sheikh Tafiq Chaudhary and he was telling about how different kind of people make dua and he was giving an example of his children, but how each of his child, when they need something from him, they ask him in a different manner. And by the way, please do watch it on YouTube. What if this was your last Ramadan? Okay? And he said that his youngest child, when she wants something, she won't say anything. She will just start screaming and whining and crying. And she always wins. The others, they come and they plead and they beg and they ask politely. And then what happens? They're just told no and they give up. But the youngest child, the three-year-old, she doesn't give up. She starts with a cry, a loud noise, and she ends with that also. So she always wins. So he was saying basically, that why is it that when we're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we make dua once, and we don't see anything happening, and we give up. Or we don't cry before Allah. We don't cry before Allah. We don't beg Him the way we should beg Him. If we begged Him, then what would happen? Our duas would be accepted. Because you don't refuse someone who's begging you constantly. So when 
We want things to happen. They're not happening. Perhaps we need to ask Allah more. We need to beg Him more. Some more. Reflect on ourselves. Our deficiencies. Seek forgiveness from Him. And then inshallah, the ways will open. But until they open, don't give up. Never ever give up. The prophets of Allah suffered the most. The Prophet ﷺ, he suffered for 13 years in Mecca. Didn't he? Yusuf ﷺ, he suffered for so many years in prison. And before that as a slave. But he was a muhsin. And who is muhsin? The one who does ihsan, who worships Allah beautifully. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to do that in our daily lives.